Hello, everyone, and welcome to CBA's At The Bar, a podcast where young and youngish lawyers discuss legal news, events, topics, stories, and, well, whatever else strikes our fancy, really. I'm your host, John Amarillo of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister, and co-hosting the pod with me today is Catherine Sanders-Reach of the Chicago Bar Association. Say hello, Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Perfect. This is the AI edition, Resistance is Futile. The question we'll be answering today, exactly when will the Skynet, Matrix, the Borg Collective, whatever we call it, destroy and enslave us all? Just kidding. I think we know that Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un will do that long before AI will. Anyway, Catherine, this subject, AI, it's been in the news a lot lately with the latest dust up between billionaire business icon and obvious Johnny Depp fan Elon Musk and billionaire internet icon and probable future cult leader Mark Zuckerberg. Musk, along with a number of other kind of smart people like Stephen Hawking, have been warning us that AI presents an existential threat to humanity. While Zuckerberg and the more hopeful set tell us that's all nonsense and we should just hit the like button on this phenomenon. Catherine, we're lawyers. We judge people. We judge things for a living. Do you think we can resolve this debate today? I wish we could resolve this debate today, but it is fascinating to continue to read what's going on in the news. This is evolving constantly. Uh, there's, It seems like it's a threat. It seems like it's a promise. And that's what we're going to explore with our guests today. Why is this such a hot topic? Um, what are the practical uses? What's in development? Um, how's it changing the practice of law? And then, well, is it going to enhance law or... Or are you guys going to be Silicon Valley's next victim? That's cheerful. <laughs> so these are the questions we're going to get to. And to help us answer those questions, we have several guests with us today. Who's our first guest? Our first guest is Dennis Garcia. And Dennis is an assistant general counsel at Microsoft. And before that, he was with Accenture and IBM. Since he's worked with several tech giants, and he's a great guest to have addressing this topic, he's going to be talk. He's been talking and writing a lot about the subject lately. Excellent, Dennis. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me today. Really appreciate it. So you've been with Microsoft, IBM, Accenture, a few scrappy young startups before. Yes. Um, tell me something. Is AI coming for my job? My view is I think we should view as AI as being a, a friend of ours, not a foe. I think uh, AI may result in some legal jobs going away, but I think there's always room for great lawyers, and we don't need fewer great lawyers. We need more great lawyers. So I look at AI as really a tool for us to practice law at sort of a higher level, if you will, to be, achieve more and to get more done. So you said some of the jobs will go away. I, one of the parallels or the, the analogies I often hear uh, used with reference to AI is that it's the next industrial revolution, which, you know, when I hear that, I think, okay, that means long-term benefits like you were just talking about, but probably a good amount of short and maybe even medium-term uh, displacement and pain. Can you speak to that a little bit? What are we looking at? Sure. Well, I think, um, and there's a terrific uh, book out there by uh, uh, Klaus Schwab, who is the uh, founder of the World Economic Forum. He's the chairman of the World Economic Forum. It talks about the fourth industrial revolution, about how our society has entered into a whole new era where we're going to see technology advance at a rapid pace. And we've seen three previous uh, industrial revolutions. I think AI is an important component of the new fourth industrial revolution. And as we've seen in the past with other industrial revolutions, um, jobs may go away, but there may be opportunities for other uh, jobs and roles and responsibilities in our society. And I think from a legal perspective where AI may displace jobs or roles or for those um, tasks which are routine, maybe mundane, and which could be sort of mechanical, if you will. So give us an example of that. What do you think? Are you talking about discovery? I'm thinking about perhaps document review. Yeah. Uh, perhaps let's say if you're going to be merging with another company and you need to do an extensive review of documents, perhaps that's done by uh, younger associates in the past, uh, perhaps that can be performed by an AI system. Perhaps so due diligence kind of work. Due diligence work, yeah. maybe basic contract review. So much of what I do and my team does, we're constantly reviewing contracts from our customers, comparing contracts, looking at fallback uh, positions. And I think there is a role for AI to play in that gap analysis and that review and to do that review very quickly and then provide that information to lawyers so that they can then negotiate contracts with customers and partners. And what I view is, again, practicing law at a higher uh, level. 
Also for uh, maybe routine contracts, non-disclosure agreements, as an example. Perhaps there's an opportunity for AI systems uh, to help business clients put those non-disclosure agreements uh, in place and to plug and play certain uh, key contractual um, uh, terms. So I think for what I look at as being, I don't want to say necessarily the lower level work, but some of the more routine, repetitive work, which lawyers or paralegals, maybe younger lawyers have done in their careers, I think there's an opportunity for AI to do that work uh, at a, a faster level, maybe more efficient, and maybe at a higher quality, depending upon the task. That can be kind of dangerous, though, right? I, I've been reading in the news lately, uh, Wells Fargo's in hot water again, right. uh, because they mistakenly released, I think it was something like 50,000 uh, customer records to the opposing side in a lawsuit that included social security numbers, bank account numbers, and that was all done as part of a doc production run by AI. So um, are, are, is that just a failure of the technology, a failure of supervision? Where, what do you think that uh, In that votes? particular um, example, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was all the above, you know, who knows. Uh, but I do think AI, at least in the legal industry, is still very much in its infancy. I think AI in general is still in its infancy. I don't think we're going to see uh, the, 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 the impact, the significant impact uh, of AI on the legal profession until maybe three, four, or five, maybe even 10 years down the road. And I think with all technology, uh, it takes time to, to get better and it will improve over a period of time. So um, I do think we have to give it some time. But I think if you're thinking about test driving uh, AI solutions, you definitely want to stay close to it. You want to monitor it and you want to oversee it. Okay. I feel like there's still going to be a role, obviously, for lawyers to feed the intelligence and the facts and the data and the information and make sure the connections are made in the artificial intelligence bots for a while. And the other thing I read the other day, that while artificial intelligence may come to power, um, emotional intelligence is going to be where lawyers' skill sets can really come into play. I, I think lawyers are so great at emotional intelligence. Well, it's something that you want to start working on now. If, it's, if That is can be a learned behavior. It's not something that, I mean, some people are good at it, but it is it can be a learned behavior, and so that's an opportunity to get better. I think that's a great point, Catherine, and I think AI won't replace a lawyer's empathy, their judgment, their creativity, their bedside manner with clients, if you will, building relationships with clients. Those won't go away. And I think what it means is that all lawyers, as we move into this new world of the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence, we need to embrace what we speak a lot at Microsoft, of embracing the growth mindset and learning you know, new skills every single day. And I think for the younger lawyers, I think there's also an opportunity for law, uh, law schools to provide maybe better training uh, for younger lawyers as they get out in the marketplace. And they're going to maybe in some respects competing with some of these AI tools. And how do they differentiate themselves and provide higher impact services to their clients? You're not actually suggesting that law schools teach law students how to practice law, are you? Because that'd be pretty revolutionary. Perhaps. I'm a little bit removed from law school now, <laughs> about 25 years or so ago. I don't remember too much from law school. Um, but I do think there is... Uh, a real opportunity for, um, especially, let's face it, I mean, these, these students are paying a lot of money for, for, for yeah. tuition, uh, maybe jobs you know, could be tough to get sometimes nowadays. And I think, uh, I do think law schools owe it to uh, law students and have a responsibility to provide better skills uh, for a 21st century lawyer. Let me, let me push back, play devil's advocate a little bit. Catherine, you said um, you led in with the, the EQ thing, and Dennis, you picked up on that and said there's always going to be... Uh, a role for lawyers to understand their clients and be empathetic and their their needs. But Catherine, yesterday when we were preparing for this pod, you sent to me something called an article about uh, a woe bot. So <laughs> with a, was it W O E it's bot? W O E bot. And its function was to essentially be a cyber therapist. Yes, it is a Facebook Messenger bot. I mean, that just sounds so annoying and ridiculous. But <laughs> if, if AI advances to, you know, the point where we see uh, where we see it in sci-fi films, will there be a need uh, for lawyers to provide that kind of counseling and support? If 
I, I still believe that's the case. I mean, you know, it's hard to predict what the future is going to be all about, right? So, you know, we're thinking 10, 15, 20 years from now. It's going to be hard to anticipate those needs. But uh, I'm still of the mindset that there will always be a room for great lawyers. And lawyers are so important to the fabric of our society and moving forward. We saw the role that uh, lawyers, great lawyers played in the uh, in the immigration ban uh, several months ago with the Trump administration uh uh, you know, move forward on and how we had so many great lawyers at O'Hare Airport helping uh, immigrants and their families get into this com- country safely. So I think there is going to be still a role for great lawyers <clears throat> in our society. But again, I think all lawyers are going to have to grow and provide a differentiated type of counseling uh, to their, their clients. And it may not just be legal things. Maybe it's business counseling as well. So uh, I think it comes down to all professionals Differentiating themselves, growing, uh, figuring out how they build their brand, basically, and uh, and, and constantly learning new things uh, and providing uh, higher impact to their business clients. Let's run with that for a second, because one of the things I've seen uh, articles talking about the use of AI in the law, and one of the things they mention is predicting litigation outcomes. And I know a lot of uh, PE firms, private equity firms who are doing that kind of investment. Um, they're also investing in technology that they think will help them predict litigation outcomes. Um, is that going to push the law into like some kind of algorithmic exercise? You should or you shouldn't sue. You should bring this claim or you shouldn't bring that claim. This kind of claim is only successful in front of this judge this often. It, it makes me wonder how the law can advance if we're reducing it to, uh, you know, numbers like that? I think it's an interesting question, a great question. We talk a lot about Microsoft and the legal department about the importance of helping our clients engage in smart risk-taking, maybe even smarter risk-taking. I think having those tools available to lawyers can help the business clients engage in that smarter risk-taking and to try to quantify, and not with absolute certainty, but maybe with a high degree of confidence, uh, the likelihood of prevailing in in a a legal action or not. I think the key thing, though, with litigation, as we all know, it's always a wild card. You never know what's going to happen, you know, when you're in litigation, right? Depending upon the judge, the venue, the lawyers, uh, lots of variables involved. But I think to the extent that you have more tools, especially more algorithms and more data to help lawyers, um, help business clients engage in smarter risk-taking and practical advice, basically, I think that that's a good thing. I think it only helps providing higher client service uh, to your business clients. <clears throat> and I think you're still going to have disputes. And I I already know several people who do mediation or arbitration who are getting more and more and more business. So <clears throat> maybe that's the skill set you should build, and not necessarily the you know preparing to go to court. Um, figure out how to de- uh, de- do you, do fee disputes to do um, other disputes that come up. Uh, that a bot probably can't handle because, again, it's got the emotional aspect to it. Right. Uh, that makes sense. It's hard to imagine a AI doing a mediation or an arbitration. Yep. Yeah. All right. I think that's probably a good place to break. Stick around, everybody. We're going to be right back with our next guest. You won't want to miss him. <laughs> Seeking to expand your legal network, sharpen your skills, and obtain free CLE? Unless you plan on being a professional failure, that's probably a good idea. Join the Chicago Bar Association today and connect with lawyers and judges who lead Chicago's legal community. The CBA will help you expand your personal and professional networks while providing practical programs and resources that meet your specific practice needs. New lawyer membership starts at just $82 a year. Learn more at (laughs) www.chicagobar.org. And we're back. Catherine, who's our next guest? Our next guest is Connor Malloy, who is a partner at Shy City Legal. Connor is a graduate of the inaugural class of the Justice Entrepreneur Project, which is a legal incubator that focuses on helping new lawyers learn to leverage technology and back office productivity to offer predictably, and this is my term, predictably priced legal services to modest means income clients. And the reason I call it predictably priced is because I don't like to say alternative fees or flat fees because there's all sorts of fee agreements, fee arrangements that you can do. But what I think a consumer is looking for is something predictable. How long is this going to take? How much is it going to cost? Um, or some ballpark thereof. And not necessarily that it's a flat fee because that doesn't work for everybody in every um, case. But <clears throat> that's Connor. 
working yeah. with the modest means income clients. I've tried those flat fees before. I always lose money on them. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Connor, welcome. Thank you. And I lose money on them too sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, before we get into the AI thing, tell us about the JEP really quickly, because Catherine mentioned it. Sure, sure. So the JEP, uh, it's a class of usually new lawyers jumping into the game and learning the tools in order to practice. You were talking about before where law schools aren't necessarily the best venue to learn how to practice law. So the JEP gives you some of the tools, practice management tools, connections, you know, even touring a court and learning how to file, stuff like that. And then, you know, there's some CLE built into it, uh, but it's a good place to start. And it allows some pro bono, too, so you can get uh, some substantive work as well. That's great. And if people want to learn about that, where can they find out about it? JEPChicago.org. They're doing some information sessions at the end of this month as well. That's great. So let's get back to AI. Uh, Connor, I logged on your firm's uh, webpage yesterday and a chat box. Uh, popped out at me. Um, and it, I noticed there was the chat box and also like a topic selection device, essentially for what, why I was going to your website, what I wanted to talk about, what I was curious about, sort of a choose your own adventure approach to uh, to finding a lawyer. Is that AI? So when I think about AI, and we were talking before about the Goliaths out there, you know, that can throw tons of money at being able to create certain systems uh, that you would think of as, you know, AI, like a Skynet type of thing, you know, very high level. We look at it as more of, you know, if that's the Goliath, we're more of the David. And when I think of AI, it's really employing technology just to be able to handle some sort of a task. And, you know, because if you take it in a very broad term, So what you're looking at is basic AI, you know, ones and zeros, choose your own adventure. So on the back end, what does that look like? How does that help you in your practice? When when someone logs on your website, they say, I'm looking for a lawyer to help me with this kind of business dispute. Does it like direct that person to the lawyer in your firm who handles those kind Mm -hmm. of disputes? What's going on behind the scenes? Sure. So, you know, not that I receive any sort of compensation from them, but uh, the chatbot that we use is from a company called Motion.ai. They're out of Naperville. It's a, just a new startup. Uh, and it's you don't need to code. It's just a WYSIWYG. You know, what you see is what you get. Drop in, you know, little segments along the way in order to create a chatbot. So that is pretty easy to put together. But a lot of the tech that's working in the background, so when somebody interacts with it, and clicks on something or enters data, that's getting fed back through uh, sort of an infrastructure that I created so I can get pertinent pieces of information. And, you know, because in the area that we practice in, it's very segmented. Uh, How's that? Well, you were saying before that, you know, talking about distilling the law into, you know, the pieces parts. When it comes to landlord-tenant litigation, there's only so much wiggle room that, that you can really explore. So that's what's going on uh, in the chatbot. It, it's, is it this or is it that? And it, it guides you along the way. So once I get basic information, I know exactly where they are. I know exactly where they're going to be going and how much it's going to cost to get there. So it's essentially an intake interview yep. process. Yep. Oh. Do you use AI in any other aspects of your practice? So... There are certain things that I'm working on right now in order to create a chatbot essentially just for clients to be able to check the status of their case where they can say, hey, what's going on or what happened in court? And being able to take that natural language, throw it through our back end system, retrieve the data that we have from our public facing notes and the like, and being able to deliver it to the client. Because that's one of the things, especially for my practice, uh, a lot of people in the landlord tenant arena the ratio of attorneys to matters might be very lopsided. So you might have one client who has 100 evictions. We'll have one client with one eviction. So we have many, many clients at any given time. Sure. And so we need to be able to leverage that ratio and increasing the communication is one way of doing it. So instead of replacing you, your AI is helping you and it's almost <laughs> acting. And and we've seen this ex-AI with, with Amy and I can't remember the mail calendar part. Um, you can sign up for a service for a bot that basically schedules appointments for you. So if you don't have an assistant or Cartana or Siri or all of these other kind of, you know, things that 
take data from one place and give it to you in another um, place because you ask for it. And that sounds like kind of what you're going to be leveraging. And that might be client facing, that might be just internal, you know, but I think there are some interesting uses that aren't scary, (laughs) that aren't taking over lawyers' jobs, um, but actually help you do your job Which gets us to the modest means income client thing because, you know, there's been full service representation and then a whole lot of people who feel like they can't afford legal services, um, don't even know they have a legal problem. And I'm seeing a lot of different technologies out there trying to solve for those issues, whether that's um, the, the, the ABA put out a project for veterans so they can go through kind of a chat bot and figure out, well, this is the problem that I'm having, and this is how I can start getting help with that problem. So and like it's one leading of the, it to information. One of the problems that we've seen a lot in the legal community lately, as you know, is, uh, a, you know, there's a glut of lawyers and also a undersupply of lawyers who can do the kind of work of the JEP and serve the underserved. So you're saying this kind of uh, tech could actually help bridge that gap? I think so. Because the other thing is we have been a very empowered consumer at this point. I can go online and do practically anything. In fact, right before I came down, I was going, I went to the uh, the car dealership service website to book my own appointment. Back in the back, you know, day, you would call, you know, somebody to yell for someone else. You'd sit on hold, you know, all the, all of the, you can do everything in the middle of the night online now. <laughs> so when you've got someone who, like, for instance, I was a condo board president. When did I have That's time to work idea. on the condo? Why would you yeah, do that? Why would you uh, do I, that? I actually had a lawyer say, friends, don't let friends be on the condo board. But at any rate, no one was my friend, evidently. But it was one of those things where, um, the time that I had to deal with that was not during my work day. That was at night. Um, and, you know, and my lawyer worked during the day, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Now, he was very good at responding to emails and things like that. But, you know, if I had been able to kind of self-help, um, put the dispute up, because we were constantly having little minor disputes between people and needed to have, like, I used him as my King Solomon all the time. Um, so, you know, anything that that could be automated, he'd still be my lawyer. Right. But I'm kind of hearing two things. In the last segment, Dennis told us that, uh, you know, a lot of tech can uh, do some of maybe basic legal work, like uh, drafting contracts and that sort of thing. And um, in this segment, what I'm hearing a little bit is maybe could actually help small lawyers and solo lawyers and small firms. I, I'm just, I think people's, uh, um, you know, hesitation is that we don't know where that's going to wash out. And it doesn't seem like we have a good idea of where that's going to wash out. Connor, what, what, I mean, obviously you're using some of it in your practice. Do you, how do you find it? Find the AI that's out there? Yeah. You know, I started searching for just chatbots and maybe, you know, I know a little bit more than the average bear when I was going out there and looking for solutions. Um, but a lot of this stuff, you know, lawyerist is always exploring different things, you know, that, that are popping up. But uh, the motion AI caught me off guard and mm. because it was something that needed no programming because... Once upon a time, you know, I programmed, I knew VB.net, made stuff in Visual Studio and all that jazz, but I have to make money now. I can't tool around with code all day long. Right. So that was the perfect solution for me. Um, it's really about thinking what ends you want to meet. So, for example, to keep our costs low, we can't really have any sort of front desk. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's no paralegal. There's no secretary doing anything. We have a remote receptionist, a virtual receptionist, and they pass data right through our system. Uh, But beyond that, it's just two lawyers knocking out the work. And so So who brings you like coffee in the morning when you're hungover? The coffee in the morning? Yeah. I want to get one of those cool 80s robots eventually. That would work. Like with the mouse that. trap kind of thing, It'll maybe. Be gorgeous. Yeah, that would be a throwback. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. we're not there. I haven't made the big bucks yet. But well, once, Dennis is at Microsoft. Maybe when he's back in the next segment, we could ask him see if he's working on a that. closet somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, that's that's how we run. We, you have to run a lean ship. And I think you know, you're going to see it happen with the larger firms too. Uh, that you know a lot of this stuff, it's not proprietary anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I guess once upon a time, if you had tons of money to 
you know, hire a consultant and bring in programmers to develop a proprietary system, the you know, day was yours. But now you can get all this stuff as software as a service. You know, and you know, one of the big things that we use is Zapier to connect all this stuff together. You know, it couldn't get any easier. Right. You mentioned uh, large firms. It seems to me, you know, in the go-go 90s, the big firms were making uh, just mountains of cash on doc review and things like that. That was a major revenue source. Now that's pretty much dried up. Um, do you see, how do you see lar- large firms using AI uh, to actually increase profits, um, you know, rather than just replacing their junior associates? Now, I never worked in a large firm setting. I went straight into a solo practice, but it's exactly what we were talking about before, you know, to be able to knock out this really no brainer work, you mm-hmm. know, for somebody to, to mine some sort of uh, a data source, you know, where you're breaking down case law into its pieces, parts and looking at probability, it, it doesn't seem like it's rocket science to me, especially if you have something parsing that language. You know, I, I'm sure you could get judges with colorful language and certain opinions, but it's going to think of any who use that. <laughs> I, I would never wish verdict searching on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say I've done it, but I trust you. But it, it seems it, it seems like that's a great thing for, for a large firm to knock out is, you know, and then you're going to wonder, honest to goodness, what partners are doing at that point. Yeah, I'm a partner and I, honest to goodness, wonder what I do every day. So I think that's probably right. I think that's probably a good place to take a break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. And we're going to have uh, both our guests back for a roundtable. Need a lawyer? Steve? I do. You look like you need a lawyer. The Chicago Bar Association Lawyer Referral Service has been making referrals for over 70 years to attorneys who have been thoroughly screened for experience in over 40 different areas of the law. Call 312-554-2001 or visit us online at www.chicagobar.org backslash LRS. And we're back with Dennis and Connor. Guys, welcome back. Thank Thank you. you. So one of the things I want to do with this segment is just talk about what big issues do you guys see on the legal horizon with AI and the practice of law? Well, from my perspective, one of the um, the fundamental elements of AI is this whole notion of getting access to massive, massive amounts of data, right? And we're living in a data-first world in many respects, and almost every organization is a data company. So I think um, there are some interesting questions or issues involving the protection uh, and security of that data and, and large amounts of data. What laws apply, as an example? In our country, unfortunately, some of the uh, data uh, privacy laws are are a little bit dated, no pun intended. Uh, Other places in the world, in the European Union, we're seeing a newer law come into effect called the General Data Protection Regulation come in May of uh, 2018. So at times, it's unclear as to what laws apply, where you have data scattered throughout the world in a mobile first, cloud first uh, environment. So I think data protection, data security, I think as a corollary point, another issue is uh, cybersecurity with all this data out right. there. How are you uh, going to protect that data? And you're, in a way, uh, I think increasing the surface area of potential cyber attacks and cyber issues. So th- that's one of the things I'm really curious about, actually, because it seems to me, at least from my layman's knowledge of AI, that it works uh, better and better the more inputs it has, the more it learns, right? Well, the more information you feed it uh, to help people, the more information you're giving it about people and the more you're centralizing that information. So a really good hacker um, could hack into, I'm not saying this would happen, but Microsoft's AI and gather probably uh, just tons of information about people. Uh, what what kind of security measures can be good, put in place other than, you know, trying to, um, well, I don't even know. Well, I think what it means is a really good practice point is if you're a lawyer or a business person thinking about moving uh, to an AI solution, make sure that you're appropriately vetting 
your technology provider. Understand what sort of leading best-in-class security practices or protocols are they employing to safeguard your data? What sort of compliance standards are they adhering to? Making sure you're doing that extensive due diligence, if you will, and make sure that you're only going to be working with a provider that you can truly trust nowadays. But I think uh, and one great skill many lawyers have is this notion of doing thoughtful due diligence and that sort of investigation and evaluation. Not about our own lives. So. Not about our own lives. Yeah, but just when uh, we're paid for it. But for technology providers, it's an absolute uh, imperative that you really do that uh, that thoughtful due diligence. I'm a little biased working at Microsoft. Uh, we have <laughs> what we think is an incredible trusted cloud narrative. Um, more and more companies are moving to the cloud uh, and protecting their data. But again, make sure that you're doing that proper evaluation of any technology provider which can have access to not just your data, but your client's important data as well. So how do you do that though? I mean, it's from what you described at the top of this segment, it sounds like it's essentially the wild, wild west out there from a regulatory uh, standpoint. How does a lawyer find out, how does a lawyer do that kind of diligence, I suppose I'm asking? Well, what I think is uh, making sure that you get the right people in the right place at the right time. And the lawyers need to play an important role in that. I think uh, your risk management and compliance professionals ha have to be actively engaged. Your privacy leaders, uh, privacy law is evolving and changing as we speak. Make sure you get people who understand that uh, changing landscape, your security folks. You need to get a virtual team. I think of those four stakeholders involved early and often and doing that analysis. But that said, it's still a little bit of a wild card, right? Because there really are no AI-focused laws or standards out there. Um, but I but I think um, the key point is, is really, I think, skilling up in the area of privacy and, and data security. And I think that's the area you should focus on first. And then hopefully you can make a, a thoughtful, smart risk-taking decision as to which technology provider you choose. And that seems to be like the area of the law right now that just has um, unlimited growth potential, right? And I think that's a great point, too, because I think a lot of uh, lawyers are worried about AI and how it may impact their future employment and jobs. But I think AI provides an incredible opportunity for lawyers to really get in on the ground floor of this growing area and to show their expertise or to have an AI-focused practice group and to really help shape the law, if you will. Yeah. I think kind of tangential is this concept of the Internet of Things, which I think AI is intersecting with um, so that you have uh, <laughs> the Terminator. There, There's actually a, um, uh, a Kickstarter out there for a a kind of echo like device, but it's the Terminator's head. So you can you can talk to Amazon. But when. Amazon is talking to the internet, getting data for you, and then telling your refrigerator what to do. That all, and this stuff is happening so fast that that's what kind of freaks me out. Is um, there was already a case where somebody bought an intelligent um, uh, garage door opener and closer so they can do it from their phone. They gave a bad Yelp review about the company, and the company locked them out of their garage. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. That's so even fantastic. at a very, like, low level, <laughs> not even, you know, just like that yeah. kind of thing. How, who, how do you go about dealing with the legal ramifications of that? Right. And then on the other end, it's not quite uh, a legal problem, but I saw that article about Facebook, how— um, they developed an AI system that started talking to itself in its own language and they had to shut it down because that is Skynet scary. Uh, but even just the little mundane stuff like getting locked out of your garage by a, by a begrudged uh, company, that, that's, wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. You know, I think another issue, a corollary point to uh, data protection is with all this uh, increase of massive amounts of data, uh, when should government have access to that data, right? And that's a very, you know, it's a, sometimes a little bit of a tricky subject. And on one hand, the government uh, needs to protect us in the interest of national security to protect us. But also we have these timeless values in our country about uh, protecting the privacy interests of individuals. And we need to balance that appropriately. So looking at some other things on the horizon in terms of AI, we were thinking about if AI starts practicing laws, that UPL, and how do you even go about kind of dealing with that. So there's this uh, little AI bot called Do Not Pay that a non-lawyer in the UK came up with. 
it's now been enhanced with thousands of different kinds of matters that can take on and every in the UK and across the US. And you go to the website and you type in a couple of words, any words. It just says, what's your problem? And then it starts asking you more questions until it gives you, you know, a rudimentary kind of response. And sometimes it doesn't do so well at all. But, you know, as this thing gets smarter, that does seem like a threat. Is this a threat, Connor? So, well, on the flip side, too, is my chat bot, or at least some of the ideas that I have for mine, have, I've been accused of giving my chat bot unauthorized practice of law abilities, even though if a lawyer programs one to be able to diagnose something in the same way I would interpret your facts and apply the law to it, is that mm. legal advice? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's the same thing I give you. But, you know, I've looked at uh, do not pay. I looked at it a long time ago, too, when it was just handling stuff for the Brits and, you know, dealing with their parking issues. I think it, like millions of dollars, maybe it, it's excused. Then I started looking at it once they unveiled the new one, maybe about a month or so ago, uh, especially because representing landlords, I noticed that it's very consumer friendly. So it's looking at tenants and, you know, fixing issues inside of units. So it's not necessarily doing any legal documents. It's doing things that are of legal significance for now, but it makes my landlords that are nervous, you know, because they're renting the unit upstairs or things like that, where they don't have compliance. Mm. So if you get hit with something and you don't know how to respond to it, well, now that's going to have some pretty se serious legal ramifications. And so my thought is to introduce a bot to have the bat all the bots. Uh, yeah, and, and essentially you just say, okay, well, what happened? Well, I got a letter from my tenant. All right, here's a letter to send back to him. You know, I'm working on it. So that that's something that, you know, I'm trying to do to be able to combat it. But, you know, being able to draft legal forms, you know, I don't even know when that becomes uh, unauthorized practice. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting issue. Um, you know, as AI advances, I think we're going to need to look to American Bar Association, state... If they're uh, still around. If they're still around. And state bar associations to maybe render ethics opinions as to what's what's the rules of the road here and what's uh, the authorized practice of law and what's unauthorized practice. And I think we're going to need some guidance from them. As we know, though, that sometimes those entities move a little slowly, right? Um, so, um, but I think we're going to need some... Uh, thought leadership from them. Well, and I have also been reading a lot lately about kind of the uh, the protection of the guild. There's a certain group of people who think that the bar associations and ethics opinions are all about kind of protecting the, the profession and not protecting and in, in their interests um, in the face of emerging technology. And so, you know, I think what, what needs to be the focus is protecting the consumer, not the protection of the profession, but protecting the end user of legal services so that there is not harm done um, and unintended consequences. And I think if, if that is the focus of, you know, these investigations and the UPL and the ethics opinions and all that, I think that, and that is made purposeful <laughs> and distinctly clear from their investigations and not just knee-jerk suing because you've got something that competes with lawyers. I think people will see that. Yeah, I'm really wondering, just listening to this conversation, if this isn't going to make pro se litigants even a bigger pain in the ass to deal with because, you know, they know just enough to be dangerous and this is only going to make that phenomenon worse. I got to tell you, having looked at the e all this e-filing that's coming out in, in Illinois and um, thinking about a pro se patron, even being able to put the filing together, the the, the actual processing of the document, um, for all the bookmarks and hyperlinks and things that are required, um, that's going to take advanced training <laughs> And word processing. So for now, I'm going to be interested to see how all of that really plays out. The other, I think, interesting legal issue is the intellectual property ramifications of AI and what's patentable or not. And I could see a number of companies trying to file patents in the AI space. And it'll be interesting to see over a longer period of time, are we going to see some of the smartphone patent wars we saw a few mm -hmm. years ago? in the AI space as becomes a, a more mature technology. But I think that's also a sort of an interesting uh, 
legal area, which is going to grow further. You have some insider trading knowledge on Microsoft for us, Dennis? I cannot share anything. (laughs) All right, we'll talk afterward. So before we wrap up today, we're going to play a game we like to call Stranger Than Legal Fiction. Each of us has done a bit of poking around the interwebs and found some of the strangest laws on the books in this oh-so-fair country of ours. Catherine and I are going to summarize one of those real laws and another law we completely made up. And then we're going to ask everybody, including ourselves, if we can distinguish which is a strange legal fact and which is fiction. Everybody got it? Is this yes. worth any CLE? Uh, absolutely <laughs> not. But you're welcome to try to apply for I'll, it. I'll give it a shot. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Catherine, you're up. Okay, so I'm doing the Chicago edition of the Stranger the Lingual Fiction. Appropriate. So in Chicago... Those who are under 21 can drink and serve alcohol legally, but they must be enrolled in a culinary program to do so. All right. What's the other one? The other one is you may be arrested for vagrancy if you do not have at least one dollar bill on your person. Hmm. Dennis, what do you think? I think the second one is real. Okay. All right. Writing that one down. Connor? As a solo practitioner trying to make it week to week, I'm nervous about the second one. <laughs> but I, I think it I think it might be the first one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Connor, I think I'm with you, especially in this cashless society that we're in right now. I'm gonna say one. What is it, Catherine? Interestingly enough, both were laws. But that's the, not the game. But the second <laughs> was repealed. Uh, and if you go and look at all the fake laws or the the strange law websites, this one about the dollar bill and vagrancy comes up over and over, but it is actually not on the books anymore. And in fact, no one can find it. I found where it might have been taken out. Yeah, so, vagrancy laws have run into one or two <laughs> constitutional problems <laughs> over the years. Bingo. Yeah. All right. Next one. In Skamania County, Washington State, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My apologies to everyone in Washington if I didn't. It's not only illegal to kill Bigfoot, but anyone who ignores that law is guilty of homicide provided the coroner of Skamania County can prove that the creature is actually a humanoid. That's option number one. Can't kill Bigfoot. If you do, it's homicide, but only if the coroner can prove Bigfoot is a person. Option two, in South Carolina, it's illegal to label for sale a sauce as South Carolina barbecue sauce or South Carolina mustard sauce, unless 51% of the ingredients are sourced from within the state. Connor, what do you think? I'm guessing the people of South Cackalacka are very protective (laughs) over their barbecue sauce. So that's got to be the real one on the books. Uh, state's definitely known for that. Dennis, what do you think? Well, first off, I just want to thank you. I'm a Microsoft lawyer, and Microsoft is incorporated in Washington State. So thank you for at least recognizing <laughs> my Washington State in, in one of the laws. But uh, I'm with uh, Connor. I, I would go for, for number two. I think number two is the real law. Catherine? Gosh, of course, I think it's number two is the real law. But because I, I have to kind of break the tie here, I'll have to go with one even if I'm losing. <laughs> Catherine is the winner, Woo-hoo. believe it or not. I found this one on the website, did not believe it, went to the county's website, looked up the ordinance. It's there. You could be in real trouble if you shoot anything that you think looks like Bigfoot. So for hunters in Washington, for all your Microsoft colleagues, Dennis, you should probably forward this pod I to will them let and let them, them know. be aware of this Weekend interesting retreats. law. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's going to be our episode for today, everybody. I want to thank our guests, Dennis Garcia and Connor Malloy, for joining us today and putting our minds somewhat at ease about what uh, about uh, how we'll be treated by our future AI robot overlords. It was a lot of fun, guys, and I hope you'll consider coming back to the pod again sometime soon. I also want to thank everyone who makes this machine run, including my co-host today, Catherine Sanders-Reach, as well as Jen Byrne, our exec, and our sound crew, Ricardo Islas and Steve Weirich. Remember, you can follow us or send us comments, questions, episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CBA at the bar. That's CBA at the bar spelled out A-T-T-H-E-B-A-R. Please also rate us and leave us your feedback on iTunes or wherever you download your podcast. It helps us get the word out. Until next time, for Catherine Sanders Reach and all of us here at the CBA, this is John Amarillo, and we'll see you at the bar. Bye.